Praise the Lord. Just turn to your neighbor and ask them, how are you doing? And tell them what you learned last week. Last week we began a series. Just tell them what you learned. I don't want you to sit down yet. And then open the book of Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. Let's read God's word together. Judges chapter 6. Please read Judges chapter 6 to chapter 8. But today we focus on chapter 6 verse 7 to 31. I'll read quickly. Are we there? When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of the Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove, you, I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. Verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak tree in Ophir that belonged to Joash, the Abizarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a winepress to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord be with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has, he, has, the, has this happened to us? Where are all the wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Do not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Verse 15, pardon me, Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat from the ether of flour. He made flour, he made bread without yeast, putting meat in a basket and its broth in the pot. He brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of the Lord said to him, take the meat and the unlivered bread, place it on this rock and pour out the broth. Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unlivered bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, alas, Sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, for you are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. On this day, it stands in opera of the Abyssalites. That same night, the Lord said to him, Take a second bull from your father's herd. The one seven years old, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah's pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you have cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the town's people, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning, when the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished. 
with their sharers pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other, who did this? When they uh, carefully investigated, they were told Gideon, son of jo Joash, did it. The people of the town demanded that Joash bring out his son. He must die because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah's pole beside it. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, are you going to plead ba uh, Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. So because Gideon broke down the altar, Baal's altar, they gave him the name Jer Jerubal that day, saying, let Baal contend with him. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word. We ask that you will speak to us in ways that we will understand. I pray today, the Lord, you will break altars and family lines and confusion and dysfunctionality that continues to reign in our homes, even in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit of God, we invite you to be the Lord in this service today. And as your word is shared, would you bath faith in our hearts in the name of Jesus. We bring our hearts and our minds subject to the spirit of God. And we pray that you alone will be glorified. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, our Lord and our Savior. We honor you and we bless you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. You may have your seat in the presence of the Lord. Last week we began to talk about families and we say that families are God's idea. God's idea is that the family will reflect his image, will be that mirror that shows who God is. We say that family needs to replicate or multiply and fill the earth and we say God calls us to rule over the creation. God's idea of family. We also say that family is covenant. And we talked about the 10 principles of a Christian marriage. I won't go back there, but you are going to go back and check. However, we talked about the four goals that God has called us to, or the four covenants within the family setup. The first covenant is a covenant to the family of God. God has called us to build ourselves as members of the family of God. And we give covenant, or we keep the covenant to serve the Lord and not walk out of that uh, family of faith. The second one is a covenant of marriage. He says marriage is a covenant, not a contract of our days, but a covenant that we build. He also called us and said there is a covenant that we create in marriage for creation to bring up godly offspring. God is a creator and he has a mission and that mission is that we may bring godly offspring from us, from our families. And finally, we talked about the priestly covenant, the covenant to serve God, to speak God's word of our lives, of our families. And finally, we looked at the response of God's idea that we have seen in human beings through scripture. And we had three representatives. We had Eve, whose response was selfish. Her response was out of what is good, what is desirable, what is pleasurable. Are you making choices over God's family because of pleasure, because of fun, because of what looks good and feels good? The other response was a response to be safe. We respond because of the relationships, because of the pressure, because of the systems and the traditions of our society. Adam responded from a place of safety. He did not want to offend his wife, Eve, he responded out of safety. But Mary, the mother of Jesus, responded in surrender. And our call is that we we'll respond in surrender to God's will. That we we'll surrender our relationships. We we'll surrender our families at the altar of Christ to allow him to be center of our lives. To have his way. To show us his plan and for us to follow it. And our conclusion last week was... If you really want to have God as the center of your family, you must have a personal relationship with him. 
it begins personal. It's not communal. We may be seated here, many of us. We may be seated here as friends, as lovers, as couples, but it begins with an individual. It begins with a personal commitment to stand firm and to fight for God's agenda. In a world that refuses to have God's agenda, our call is to stand and fight for God. This morning we want to talk about family chaos. Families are chaotic. If you don't believe it, you can see me, I'll tell you about my family. But families are chaotic. Every family has its own chaos that is created by the members of that family because we are broken human beings. And if you are a member of a family, you are part of the chaos. You create it, you sustain it, and you continue to breathe chaos into the family. It is because we are fallen human beings, as individuals, as couples, as siblings, as relatives. No wonder every church is chaotic. If you find a church that is good, please don't join. Because you are going to take chaos with you. If you find a school, a workplace, a community that is free of chaos and drama, please don't join them. But all these places are filled with chaos because human beings live there. And those human beings are you and I. But unfortunately, we do not see ourselves as broken people. We don't see ourselves as sources of chaos. Look at yourself in the mirror. Do you see a chaotic person with all that makeup? No. No. And that's the problem. We see others as a problem. We don't see ourselves until you interact with other people and they tell you you're offensive. You hurt me. You disappointed me. The way you talked to me was unfair. You ignored my needs. A common term of brokenness in our society today is dysfunctionality. Families are dysfunctional. Every family on earth has its level of dysfunctionality. From Genesis to Revelation, we see families depicting their own dysfunctionality. From Eve to giving birth to children who murder each other. To Noah. To Lot. To Joseph and Jacob. A family full of deception. To Moses. List them. To David. A man after God's own heart. That I'll look at next week. Where we see trouble in paradise real trouble in a king's home who God loves we all have a family member who's rebellious a sibling who drinks a little too much a parent who's emotionally distant a grandmother who favors some grandchildren a sister who's very competitive an uncle who's vulgar and annoying and a little embarrassing. A rich aunt who is hard to reach. We all have favorites. Parents favor children. They prefer those called by their names and by their relatives and not the other side of the family. We come from families where people have hurtful patterns that seem okay because they have happened over and over and over again. It feels okay to be ignored. It feels okay to see your sibling being taken to the best of schools while your needs continue to be ignored. It seems okay because you did a mistake to always be reminded who you are. It seems okay for families where people just give birth to children out of wedlock. No one complains, no one asks the question. It seems okay. 
It seems okay to lie to each other, to hide her abuse, to drink in, you know, broad daylight. I've done youth ministry in this city. And one of the amazing things is that we have brought pubs in our own homes. They're in our fridges. They're in our parks and places where we imagine the kids will not access. But as a youth minister, I watched these children bring these drinks to camps. 300 kids, 2010, taking 300 kids to Greenstead in Akuru. And of course they know the one we are going to search. So we search and find nothing, no contraband, nothing. Day two, while sessions are going on, the 70 youth workers, we send them back to the dorms. We say, comb it up, bring every contraband. And guess what we find? Bottles of water full of liquor. Condoms. In those days, we found pornography in form of CDs and CD players. These are children. Where did they get these resources from? Where did they get? And they told us, oh, it's at home. Oh, it's in the fridge. It's become normal. And we wonder why at age nine we have an addict. Families are dysfunctional. We discriminate, we gossip, we compete with each other. We go home for Christmas while talking about our big money and our big cars that we drive. We borrow to take home. We, 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 we get into debt to ensure that we are not ignored. We put each other down. We hide abuse and say, let's settle this out of court. We kill each other for inheritance. Draw close to our dying parents so that we can be named as a true people to take care of our estates. The patterns are passed on from one generation to another. And our media does not fail to show us these dysfunctionalities. The conflict, the misbehavior, the abuse. That individual parents continuously and regularly pass from their own generation where they come from into the next generation. We all promise ourselves, I'll never do that like my mother. I'll never do that like my father. But when push is put to shove, we find ourselves doing exactly what we experienced. Children grow up, growing up in such families think such situations are normal. And it becomes a perpetuating of abuse, dysfunctionality from one generation to another. Parents who grow up in dysfunctional families may actually either overcorrect or eliminate their own parental responsibilities. Oh, I'll never spank my kids because I was abused in the name of spanking. And that represents a new generation of entitled children that have nowhere to go and no one in charge over their lives. They enter a world where there are rules, but they never learned any rules because there were no rules at home. Because making rules was so bad for you and you never dealt with your own issues in your home. In some cases, the dominant parent will be abusive. They will neglect their children, and the other parent will not object. They might mislead their children. They might even parentify them. They make them be the people that stand and take care of other children. We have parents who are very busy, who have an older child taking care of another. And because that was done to you, you are wondering, what's the problem? You are conflicting. We are conflicting as spouses and we are triangulating a child in between and speaking through that child. They are exhausted. They are tired. They are being made to choose. How do you choose a parent over the other? This pattern of dysfunctionality begins in the family. But very soon we see it in the society, 
in nations. And we are seeing it in our own nation. When we look at the book of Judges, we see a nation that was crumbling down over and over again because of patterns and cycles of dysfunctionality. And this morning, this afternoon, the goal of our conversation today is on breaking the dysfunctional patterns of our families. We have been in chaos for too long. We can no longer remain in chaos. And using the story of the Israelites in the book of Judges, we see that they went through cycles, four cycles, the cycle of sin, they would sin and they would do evil in the eyes of the Lord and they, God would allow them to do it and God would still allow them to suffer experience the consequences sometimes he would do it for many years in this particular case he allowed them to suffer for seven good years as slaves of the Midianites and I remember some time back Pastor Steve saying Sometimes the suffering we are going through is not suffering. It's our choices. And God allows his people that he loves to experience the full extent of their choices. And suffering happens. But the people of God cry out. They supplicate. They cry out to God for help. They call on the Lord for salvation. And God in his mercies brings salvation. He brings salvation. He sends a judge. He lifts a judge and allows them to actually step in and rescue God's people. And God provides two levels of salvation. The spiritual aspect that every judge is provided support for spiritual rescue, but also physical in fighting and bringing back the community to God and to freedom. And then there is a period of safety. And the worst time in any human being's life is when there is safety. Because all our guards are down. We assume life is good. We think we are the ones that are providing for ourselves. We think our marriage is good and we have nothing to pray about. We think our children are perfect. And we don't need anything for them. And that's what would happen. They would be safe. They would be free from oppression. And guess what? They would begin to admire the society before them. And allow themselves to walk away from God. And they would sin. And the cycle would continue again and again and again. If you look at the book of Judges, as many as the Judges is as many as the cycles of dysfunctionality in the family and in a nation. One of the things as a marriage and family therapist we do is that we look for family patterns. And I think it's in fulfillment of Exodus 34, 7. This is what the Lord said to Moses. And he passed in front of Moses. This is when God was uh, doing covenant, the Mosaic covenant with Moses. He passed in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children, for the sin of their parents to the third and fourth generations. I know, I know, there's Jeremiah, where God says that I am going to create a new covenant. And where the parents who ate grapes, their children's mouth or teeth will not be stained. That's correct. But as a, special, as, as, as a professional, we go back to three generations. Every time we sit with individuals and couples, we go back to three generations. We go back to your parents, to their parents, and to their parents' parents. Why? 
Because we are looking for patterns of dysfunctionality and also resources of functionality in your families. Because each family has resources, yet each family has dysfunctionalities. We look for physical illnesses and mental illnesses. We look for depression, bipolar, schizophrenia that was never identified. We say that uncle used to be mad. No, they were not mad. They were sick and no one attended to them. We know their bloodlines with diabetes. That's my bloodline with diabetes. And therefore, how I live my life must be cognizant of the fact that I lost a father through diabetes. Blood pressure. Arthritis. We get to know these things so that we help our clients to be able to know you are susceptible to this. We look at family structures. You come from a blended family. You came with your mother. You came with your father. You were rejected. And therefore you carry rejection with you. Families where they are single parent. You count this. My grandmother was single. My mother was single. My sister is single. What are we doing? What are we seeing? What will your daughter be? Divorce and separation. We put it out there in symbols, providing a clear picture for you to see cohabiting relationships and how families have cohabited in relationships over and over and over again. We see children who are born. We list stillbirths and abortions because our failure to address complicated grief becomes a problem in our very own lives. Children that were born prematurely, we overprotect them and expose them and set them up not to fight for society because we protected them. We nursed them too much. We never really did what we needed to do. We have adopted children. We put them there for you to see, by the way, there is an adopted child here. Family relationships. We represent closeness and distance, hostility. People who don't meet eye to eye are put in the genogram. We look at relationships because we are trying to ask in your time of need, who can you talk to? Who can you run to? No, I don't talk to my aunt. My mother and my, and, and my grandmother don't see eye to eye. So when we go for Christmas, people go this way, another one go this way. Family dysfunctionality. And it is so normal. It is so normal. You know why we do family genograms? Do you know why we do family genograms? It's to help you see picture, from a picture perspective, not words, from a picture. In fact, the GenoPro, which is the software for that, provides colorful colors for you to actually see. This discord that is crisscrossed, this family domestic abuse that is done like this, 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 um, this cohabiting is not a clear line, it's a dot. We let ourselves see that for two reasons. Why? One is to identify potential dangers that either us or our children have potential dangers to perpetuate those things that are in our families. It also helps us to accept. You know, if I'm the one telling you, you say, eh. But you're the one telling me and I'm just drawing it for you. Then you can accept the patterns of dysfunctionality. And the second thing is for you to initiate a different path. Each one of us need to know these things so that as you get into relationships, that you are going to create a different path. As cousins, we need to create a different path, not the path that our parents took. As siblings, we need to create a different path because we know we can stand up and make a difference as we move on. Now, using the story of Gideon, 
I want us to look at four ways of breaking family dysfunctional patterns. And I can, I can clearly continue to give you the list and the list of dysfunctionality. But the question is, how will that help you? How will that help us? Of course, part of our assignment as we finish this service is that you are going to list your family dysfunctionality. So that when you go on that date and that person wants to marry you, tell them, by the way, this is what I come with. <laughs> and then you exchange notes. And those of you who are already married say, hey, by the way, I did not tell you, this is what I come with. This is, this is what I came with 18 years ago when I came. This is what I, I'm sure they have seen them. Me, I'm sure my husband has seen them. He's already seen these things. 18 years, he's seen them. Even if I lied, he has seen them. We talk about Gideon having a direct encounter. We talk about him moving away from a diversion from, of dysfunctionality. You know, he, he diverts the attention and becomes the victim. God has left us. We'll see how that is actually a diversion from the truth. Then we'll look at divine direction and daring action. Gideon was going about his business in a time of crisis. The nation was in crisis. Midian had taken over, destroyed their crops, destroyed their property, and people were living in fear. Gideon was hiding. Gideon was actually found threshing wheat at a wine press. That's a paradox. No one threshed wheat at a wine press because wine presses were in the valley. But when you needed to thresh wheat, you needed to go on a hill so that when you pour out the wheat, the chaff will go and the wheat will be left. But because of how much destruction and risk there was, he was hiding. And Gideon was the youngest of his family members. I don't know where the others were. Maybe they were trying to see if they can fight back or they were hiding so that they are not hurt. That's what he was doing. God appears to him. This is very interesting because in the Old Testament, there are moments angels appear, but there are moments God himself appears. In this specific passage, God himself appeared. We call it the epiphany. God himself appeared. And Gideon wanted to be sure that it was God. And as a Jewish man, he knew how to do that. He needed to go fix an offering and bring it and see how the Lord consumes it and how the Lord consumed and disappeared. He knew, I really had an encounter with God. Gideon met God and his life was never the same. That is what it's supposed to be. Paul met God and his life was never the same. Marion met God. Has her life remained the same? You met God. If you have had a personal relationship with Jesus, has your life remained the same? God calls him out, mighty man of valor. But Gideon laughed because that is not what he was. The last time he had looked at himself on the mirror, he was the youngest from the youngest tribe doing some youngest last born stuff. That's not what he had seen. The problem with Gideon and with many of us is our identity. He saw himself just like everyone else saw him. him small, insignificant, inexperienced, young, with advanced childhood experiences, being bullied. That was his reason for refusing to be called a mighty man. This was not only a problem with Gideon. 
It was a problem with Moses. He says, I am a stammerer. Lord, why would you send me? Jeremiah said, Lord, I am too young. Isaiah said, I am a man of unclean lips, living among men of unclean lips. Who is not that? When God meets us, he looks at us at, as what he wants to make us. He looks at us from a place of what he is making out of us, not who we are. And our response cannot be an excuse. Many of us sit here today and vowed never to get married or start a family. That was me. And my excuse is I never grew up with a healthy family. Our excuses is, I didn't grow up with a dad, so I don't know how to be a father, I don't know how to be a husband, so don't expect much from me. I grew up with an emotionally absent parent. So this telling you, my children, I love them, see they know. <laughs> I didn't experience it. So how am I going to start giving it? My family was we were so poor, therefore my tribe does not allow us. It tells us to do this. He felt disadvantaged as a man for the job to break the family dysfunctionality. His age, his position, his status, and the state of the nation was nothing to write home about. He was from a poor family, the youngest in the family, the last born, and from the weakest tribe and the weakest clan. But God was either mocking or was sarcastic with Gideon or he was prophetic. But I choose to believe that God was prophetic. He was calling Gideon to become a mighty man of valor. God wants to use you to change your family. God wants to use you to change your generation. God wants to use you to change your community, to change your nation. But first, you need to address your self-view. You need to address how you look at yourself. You need to address how you look at your painful experiences in life, in the family. You cannot remain bitter and be used of God. Encounter him and let him bring out all the things you have looked and seen in yourself and allow him to address it. How does God see you? How does God see me? A great man, a great woman, regardless of my past experiences, regardless of my painful experiences. And next week we'll talk about addressing family pain. Because some don't need to be broken. They need to be addressed. They need to be faced. We need to put full stops to them. The difference was one. He met God and God was with him. Have you met God? Is God with you? God will make a difference when you encounter him. Number two, we need to move from the diversion from what is functional. We need to look at how we moved away from functionality. When Gideon was called mighty man of Allah, he asked God, really? Really God? You said you're with us? Are you serious? Why are we living under attack? Why are we hiding? Why are we slaves? Why are we afraid? Why are we in this situation if you are with us? Why are you allowing us to be slaves? Where are the miracles and signs and wonders that our forefathers talked about? Where are they? What happened? Why did you forsake us? Why did you leave us? To be honest, that's a very common question. God, where are you? 
Especially when we find ourselves in troubles we took ourselves to. We are hurt by God. We are bitter that God brought us there. We blame other people and how they never come to our rescue. But sometimes God creates deserts for your encounters. He does. For you to come back to your senses and return to the Father. God had not forsaken us. God has not enslaved us. We have enslaved ourselves. The reality was Israel had forsaken God, not the other way around. They had enslaved themselves. They are the ones who abandoned God and betrayed him. Earlier we are told that the Israelites when they were to occupy the land of Canaan, they were to destroy everything and everyone. When you look at Psalm 106 verse 34, the Bible says they did not destroy the people as the Lord had commanded them. They did not. They danced around and courted the sinful patterns of the society they were living in. They didn't delete that message. They allowed it to flow. And you know what? The, the configuration of your phone will bring more of that porn because you don't want to throw it away. Joshua 17, 12, verse 12 to 16. The Bible says, Yet the children of Manasseh, specific, could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities. But the Canaanites would dwell in that land. They cohabited. They lived together. They were good neighbors with people God had told them to destroy. Gideon failed to see where the dysfunctionality in his family and nation was coming from. He became a victim. He looked at himself and said, Woe ye me. Woe ye God has abandoned us. No. God has not abandoned you. You have moved away. You have walked away from the Lord. I have walked away from his instructions. We have deviated from the rule of God. We have sought alternatives in our culture. Last week we said that the family is at the core of the fight. Why? Because whoever controls the family controls the world. And whoever controls the family controls the destinies of men. In scripture we know three things will last. God, his word, and the souls of men. Those three will last. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will remain forever. For his word is forever settled in heaven. God watches over his word to perform it. But God also watches for souls of men to rescue them. You know what? It's not just about love and sex. It's your destiny that is at stake. It's your destiny of the children, of your sisters, of your brothers. Whether they know it or they don't. It's their destiny that is at stake. What are you doing about it? Are you coating with trouble? Samson, a mighty judge, was called to deliver the people of Israel. But he began to sleep with the very people that he was supposed to destroy. He did. He did. Delilah became the tool of the Philistines to actually continue to torment Israel because he chose his pleasure rather than the purposes of God. What choices are you making today? We cannot blame our parents any longer. Our grandparents and our great-grandparents, they did their mistake. We need to correct it. We need to stop diverting our attention. The true reason you and I and our families and our marriages are dysfunctional is because we have selfish pursuits. 
We have social pressure. We have refused to live ungodly friends and ungodly groups. We have continued to perpetuate the human traditions that I must pay my grandmother's dowry before mine is paid. We have perpetuated the human sin continues in the pursuit of abuse because that child is not your biological child. You will not accept them even though you love their mother or their father. Perpetuating abuse and rejection to the next generation. God is always with us. But are we with God? God is always with us. But are we blaming him for our walking away? For our pain and suffering in the family? We need to accept rather than divert attention of why we are in dysfunction of families. Divine directions. Gideon received divine direction over what to do. The Lord commanded him. He said, go. The Lord said to him, verse 14, go in the strength you have. Hey, what? The weakest of the weakest, the youngest, he has strength. God sees what he doesn't see in himself. God sees that he has strength that you have and save the Israelites out of Midian. Am I not sending you? To be very honest, if we go in our personal strength to fight the culture of our day and the things it's trying to do to us and our children and the church of Jesus, we will lose greatly. But there is strength we receive in Christ and in the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Who made Peter a weak man who wanted, who ran away to be the bold man that spoke and said, this is what happened. And we are not afraid to die. The forces that surround us to change our culture, to change our families from serving self and serving others is bigger than our strength. We are minorities in the battle to control families today. With all the social media, all the medias that you listen to every day, we are one voice, but this voice will stand before the king of kings. As we battle to control the family. Your own principles, your own values. Me, I don't drink. Me, I don't do, you know, extra women or extra men. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. We need the Lord. He's a God of all seasons. God who uses different means to deliver his people. With Samson, he used his strength. With Deborah, he used her wisdom and leadership. With Gideon, he reassured him of his presence. Friends, you need the presence of God. You need God to go with you. Remember Moses? The real thing he really wanted to lead the people? After he had led them for so long and been tired and told him, God, by the way, just take your people. They have tired me. But in Exodus 33 and verse 15, this is what Moses says to the Lord. Moses said to God, if your presence does not go with us, please do not send me out of here. And God replied, my presence will go with you. I will give you rest. Moses valued the special presence of a holy God. Because when there was famine, he provided food. When there was, a, 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 you know, drought, he gave them water. The God who sees comes through if you go with him. But if you go alone, you will use Ugali's strength and it will not be enough. You will say no, but it will not be enough. 
But if you are like Joseph and you find yourself with a Potiphar's wife whose husband has abandoned her on the call of duty and you are called and pushed and pushed with a God in you who says, but this is sin against God, you will pick up yourself and leave your clocks and leave accusations and allow the Lord to fight for you. I know we sing that song a lot. We pray that your presence go with us. If you don't go with us, you are not going. But many of us are still going and going without his presence. His divine directions definitely need his presence. Fresh continuous renewing strength because we grow weary. In the New Testament we know that he is Emmanuel, God with us. James tells us, draw near to God and he will draw near to, to you. God never moves. You and I are the people who move. In fact, a preacher said that the human sacrifice is the only one that crawls out of the altar. Because it is living. Many of us come to the altar and then begin to cry and say, hey, it's hot. Hey, it doesn't feel good. Hey, my friends don't think this is cool. And we crawl out of the altar. And finally, God is calling us to be daring. Even if we have a direct encounter with God, even if we clearly look without diverting the dysfunctionality and see the right thing, even if we continue to receive divine directions, there must be a place where you act. You know, in the call of faith, there is God's work and your work. A lot of us keep leaving God's, God to do their work. Yeah? God has already done his work. You need to do yours. God told Gideon, go, destroy the Midianites. Do you realize this is a statement of grace in verse 16? Because he had already said that earlier. But the parents and the grandparents never listened. But he is saying that again. Friends, I told you last week that every marriage, every family that has begun is a reset button of God's agenda for your family. And he's giving this instruction again. Go and destroy. Every single day, God gives this instruction. Go and destroy all the Amalekites, all the Midianites. A God of grace. He's still calling you today. Gideon had God. He repented. He saw things. He actually made what we call a fellowship offering. This was an offering, a sacrifice in the New Testament that was given by human beings, especially priests, to express peace with God. He quickly went and made peace with God. As a worshiper of Yahweh, he became the priest of his family and his community at a time where there was no priest and no voice. Verse 24, he worshipped the Lord. He erected a new altar for himself and for his family and for his clan. He repented and was restored to trust God. But that was not enough. To repent and to recommit your life is not enough. You have to obey the instructions. And these were the instructions given to, to Gideon. That God is giving us. Break down. Your family patterns. Break down. God told Gideon. Go bring down. Your father's altar. Bring it down. Tear it down. And then he told him. Build up the altar for God. Start a new family. Legacy. Family rituals, family beliefs, family values. And then he says, you still have to fight the enemies of God and of family. 
I hear the Lord calling us to the three things today. Break down your family dysfunctional patterns. I want you to take a few minutes and write them down. You cannot break what you don't know. What are your family dysfunctional patterns? Some of us have been told girls in this family don't get married. And when they do, they always come home. They come back. So this family, we all get children with different fathers. This family, we've all been abused sexually by our fathers. For him to take you to high school or college, he needs to sleep with you. For some of us, poverty, poverty, favoritism, you can see it down, down, down. And what are you doing with your children? Which one do you like better? In my own family, there are two things I know very well. Drinking and immorality. And those are the two altars in my life. I have chosen. I'm not going down. I have family here. We have uncles from different, from my side of the family, from my dad and my mom's side, whose lives are totally hopeless today. In fact, I have one functional uncle from my mother's side. whose son is among us today. That's the one functional uncle. One. And it is Jesus who changed his life. Because even him, he was going to that direction. One. One. So I don't drink because I'm saved. I don't drink because I know that I have the genetic capability of what my family has. I know. It is there. I don't entertain flirting because I know in my family I have the path of immorality. I don't go there. What are your family patterns that you will speak to your children about and tell them, my children, this is ungodly. This will lead you badly. If you don't have children, you have nieces, you have nephews. May they be your community of support. May they be the people you turn to and say, I love you too much to see you walk to hell. Gideon found ten men to tear down the altar. Who are you finding to tear down the altars? Through prayer, through accountability. Who? You can do it at night as long as you do it. God moves from allowing Gideon to work on his family issues and then takes him to a national level. Some of us are calling ourselves to be great. Greatness starts at home. If you cannot challenge and tear down your father's altar of immorality, of polygamy, of addiction, of abuse. Who are you going to fight for as an activist? Who? He gathers 32,000 men to fight. God says those are too many. He releases 22. He's left with 10. God still says those are too many. The popular opinion is not what God is looking for. He picked 300 men. And because he was with them, the tools they had to fight didn't matter. Who fights with pots and trumpets? Because that's what they went to fight with. Pots and trumpets. It's not about your education. You may not be an MFT like me or a theologian like me, but you have what it takes to fight for God in your family. What you know is enough.
to fight for your family. Shall we pray? For those of us who have been fighting, do not be tired. Because Judges chapter 8 breaks my heart. Because Gideon fought and fought and fought. And the people loved him and wanted to make him king. And he refused. He said, God is your king. But do you know what happened? He was so comfortable and Israel was so safe that he is the one who asked the people for their ornaments and clothes and he made a new idol. He led people back to prostitution in worshipping other idols. He made Hefford. Hefford became the new idol in his town. A town he had broken down. The altar of Baal and Asherah. My heart is broken every day as I look at the people who preached to us who are no longer in the faith. People who brought us and told us marriage is good but they left their spouses many years ago. Paul tells us in the New Testament be very careful if you're standing Continue to hear God. You can just go back to that cycle. That's why you looking at it every day is important. Keep building under God. Keep breaking the dysfunctional family lifestyle. Choose God. Tear down. Build his altar. Choose God, tear down, build the altar. At 40 years in marriage, choose God, tear down, build the altar of God. After graduation from school, choose God, tear down, build. As you get promoted, choose God, tear down, and build. I want us to finish our conversation today with an open altar and I'll call the pastors, I'll call the leaders, I'll call anybody to just come here because we want to pray for you. To begin to first encounter God and also to come and tear down the altars that have been erected in your family. So I want to call you, just come. Just come. Just come. Come. Come to the Lord. Bring it to him. He knows. He knows. He knows the demons you fight with. Day and night. Just come. Boldly to the Lord. Boldly to him. Just come. Just come. Pick up your stuff and come. Just come. I'll ask as many leaders, as many group leaders, as many plug-in facilitators, as many as are, are here. Just come. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray for, for, for people here. Let's, let's break. Let's break. Let this place be filled with prayer. You may not be coming, but you know. You know you need to. You know what's going on in your very own family. And you know the Lord needs to break it. Just come. Just come. The altar is open. He's here. Oh, we bless you, Lord. We thank you, our Father, our God. We ask of you this day. We ask of you, oh God of heaven, that you will come and raise and raise the altar of God in our midst in the name of Jesus. As many as will come will have enough people to pray for you. Just come. Just come. Just come. Come to the Lord. Come to the Lord. It starts. It stops with you. 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 If you don't stop it, it won't stop. It stops with you. Somebody has got to take the bullet. It stops with you. It stops with you. God is saying stop and you know it. You know it. He's asking you. Just come. Just come and allow
allow the Lord tell him break it break it break it I may be young I may be unmarried I may be young married I may have been divorced or left but it starts a new cycle a new place a new way a new goal a new hope for families and generation abuse must not remain in your life abuse must not remain in your life confusion inability to know the grace and the will of God must not remain it starts with you it starts with you it starts with you it starts with you if we have elders please come we have many people here at the altar who need prayer let's just come and pray and stand with one another and care for people just come just come just come and pray come and pray for somebody come and stand with somebody please come come to the lord come to the